All right, so 7.1. So we're gonna finish out this lesson. Level of significance. All right, level of significance is alpha, okay? So if you see alpha, that's level of significance. This is your maximum allowable probability of making a type one error. So the probability of rejecting the hoe whenever the hoe is true, that's a mistake. You want that to be small. Okay, you want it to be small. You want your alpha to be small. So this is equal to alpha. Okay? Now, there's three common levels. You have alpha 0.10, alpha 0.05, and alpha 0.01. Those are your three common levels that pop up. The thing is, if you degrease alpha, this tends to increase beta. So as your type one error gets smaller, the type two error gets bigger, okay? So in the medical field, there's a med there are several medical tests. So one test you might or might not be familiar with is pregnancy test. So the false positive, so you could have a test that gives you a false positive. You could also have a test that gives you a false negative. Okay? So the way a pre pregnancy test works is it um, you actually there's a there's a chemical that pregnant women have that um, this test tests for okay and only pregnant women produce this chemical and so the test sees if that chemical is in um, the substance <laughs> so if the test comes back positive it's almost guaranteed that you're pregnant, okay? It's very rare to get a false positive, all right? Meaning like the test came back positive, but you're really not pregnant. That's really rare. However, what's not rare, because if, if you think about it, if one is, is rare to happen, then the other one is not rare to happen. You could get a false negative, meaning you could take a pregnancy test and it says it's negative, meaning you're not pregnant, but in reality, you actually are pregnant. So it's a good idea if you think you might be pregnant, don't just take one test, take a couple of tests uh, just to make sure. Okay, same thing with drug tests. They're testing for certain um, chemicals in your body and... Um, it's possible to get a false negative, so you might get lucky and not get caught. But if you get a positive, you know, more than likely um, you might have been doing something you might sh not should have been doing, right? So, but they always make you take another test if you do get a positive just to be sure, okay? To knock out that likelihood and make it even harder. All right, so if the null hypothesis is true, then a p-value... So a p-value of a hypothesis test is the probability of obtaining a sample statistic with a value as extreme or more extreme than the one determined from, a, from the sample data, okay? So what does this look like? in a picture, right? So a picture might explain the p-value more. So we're gonna have three distributions. What's in the middle, zeros in the middle for these. There's three scenarios going on here. I have a left-tailed test. Okay, a left-tailed test. So with a left-tailed test, all right, when I have the hoe and the ha. 
all right? A left-tailed test, so maybe I have like a mu greater than or equal to some number, let's just say three. We're just making up a number. The number doesn't really matter. What matters, what's the opposite, what's the complement of greater than or equal to three? Less than three, okay? To figure out the type of test, it's a left-tailed test, I look at the ha. The ha tells me what type of test it is. How do I know it's a left-tailed test? It's pointing to the left here. I'm considering mu that are less than three. Now, the p-value, say you run off and you get a statistic. Okay, a sample statistic x bar right here. The p-value is something that extreme or more extreme. Okay, so what does that look like? That's in here or even more extreme. So the p-value is this purple area right here. It's the area as extreme or more extreme than that sample statistic right there, okay? How do I know I shade to the left? It's a left-tailed test. I look at the ha to tell me what type of test. All right, the next type of test is a right-tailed test. So a right-tailed test. Now, what is a right-tailed test? This would be like if I have a ho and a ha, where the ho is less than or equal to, I don't know, four or whatever. The number doesn't matter. And then the opposite, the complement, is mu greater than four. So how do I know it's a right-tailed test? A right-tailed test, I look at the ha. Which way is my inequality pointing? It's pointing to the right. I shade to the right. So say I get a sample statistic over here, x bar, okay? Now, the p-value here is something as extreme or more extreme. So the p-value, you could get, what's the chance of getting an x bar this extreme or more extreme? That's all this in here. That area is the p-value. Why do I shade to the right? It's a right-tailed test, okay? As extreme or more extreme. Now, I don't want you to get all caught up on thinking if it's a right-tailed test, X bar has to be on the right side. X bar could be over here. The right-tailed test, all it tells me is that I shade to the right, okay? So I hope that that makes sense. All it's telling me is which way to shade. Okay, so wherever that test statistic falls, I shade in that direction. Now the last test, instead of being a left or a right tail test, you might be saying, well, what the heck is left, Mr. Clark? It's a two-tailed test. The two-tailed test, the ho and the ha, the null and the alternative hypothesis. This would be, the last scenario would be like if I had like a mu equal to, I don't know, five. That would be equals, and then the opposite would be not equal to five. Now, not equal, I mean, that could be on one side or the other side. We don't know. So if I find a sample statistic over here, it could be just as extreme on the other side, that negative of that sample statistic over here, right? So the p-value is a little bit different because I have half of my p over here and then I have half of my p over here. So the whole p-value is split. Uh-oh. Get back. The whole p-value is split between those two tails. Okay, that's why it's a two-tailed test. Half on one side, half on the other. All right, so not equal. That tells me I put one on one side and one on the other side. It could be on the positive side, could be on the negative side. Now, the smaller the p-value of the test, the more 
evidence there is needed to reject the null hypothesis. So remember when we were talking in the last video about the, the justice system and we were trying to make sure that we did not send an innocent person to prison, okay? So we don't wanna say somebody who's innocent, we don't want to give them a guilty verdict, right? So we're trying to make alpha be small. If we make alpha small, that makes beta large. But I'm trying not to convict an innocent person. We think that that's worse than saying, okay, you were guilty, but there wasn't enough evidence to send you to prison, so we're going to let you go. We'd rather protect against sending an innocent person to prison for the rest of their life, okay? So that's why we have... We have to show beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt, what does that mean? That means we take our critical value from, okay, didn't mean to do that. I meant to just select this. Our critical value, okay, that's not a very beyond a reasonable doubt. But the more we move our critical value further and further over here, what does that do? That makes our p-value smaller and smaller and smaller, alpha, okay? So what's that telling me? A smaller p-value means you have to have beyond a reasonable doubt more evidence to show that you reject the hoe and say, you know what? The hoe was lying and therefore the hoe is guilty. Okay? So the smaller the p-value, the harder it is to reject the null hypothesis. All right? So small p-value means that's an unusual event, okay? Now, the decision rule. The decision rule says this. If P is less than or equal to alpha, then I reject the Ho. I reject H0, the null hypothesis. The decision rule for p-values if I get a p-value that's smaller than alpha, then I reject the hoe, okay? The alternative is if p is greater than alpha, then I fail to reject the hoe, okay? So I fail to reject the hoe. You need to make sure this does not mean you have accepted the hoe, okay? Just because you fail to reject the hoe doesn't mean that you accept the hoe. It just means that the alternative isn't true, okay? There could be a different alternative. It's like you assume you're going to go behind door A, right? But then it's like, well, there's not enough evidence that door B is true, but that doesn't mean that there's only door A and door B. There could be another door C, a, a third alternative, okay? So all we're saying is that door B is not a possible answer. We're not saying door A has to be the answer. We're saying door B can't be the answer, okay? So not enough evidence to reject door A all right, so um, a way to remember this, it's kind of silly, but it says if the P is low, the null must go, okay? So if the P is low, the null must go. Another way to remember this, all right, a P is low. What does it mean to be a P low? That means that P is smaller than the alpha you're given. So each problem is going to tell you an alpha. Maybe it tells you an alpha 0.05, okay? And if you find some P value, maybe the P value is 0.02, that's small compared to 0.05. If you have a small P value, you reject the hoe, okay? The null must go. That's what we're saying to do. 
A small p-value means reject the hoe. Okay, so if the hoe is the claim, this is probably the hardest concept to get for today. All right, it's, gonna, it's probably going to take you a little while to understand what's going on here. So just write it down for now, and hopefully um, later on you're, it's going to make sense. But you need time to sit and think about this. It's not going to click for you right away. If the hoe is the claim, and remember the claim can be the hoe, the claim can be the alternative. But if the hoe is the claim, then to write your answer, you're going to write there is or is not, that's the extra part, enough evidence to reject the claim, okay? And that's how you're gonna write your solution. Now this is or is not, that depends on something else we'll talk about in a little bit, okay? If the alternative is the claim, the ha is the claim, then you're gonna write there is or is not enough evidence to support the claim, and then you would write out your claim, okay? So what is the big difference here between these two statements? The first statement says reject, the second says support. So the only thing you can do with the hoe is reject. There either is or there is not enough evidence to reject. The only thing you can do with the ha is support. There is or there is not enough evidence to support. So if your claim is the hoe, then you'll write reject. And there either will be or there will not be enough evidence to reject. If the claim is the ha, you're going to support. There either is enough information to support or not enough information to support. Okay, I know it's kind of weird, but that is how it is. Okay, so you just gotta, you need to think about it. You're not gonna figure it out right now, but let's do an example. USDA limit for salmonella, salmonella contamination for ground beef. Real thing right here. The USD limit is 7.5%. Now, you ever, you ever think about why you have to cook hamburger meat, ground beef, longer than um, you would like, say, maybe a steak, that's because you're trying to kill the potential bacteria, the E. coli, whatever's in there, okay? So USDA says that it allows there to be at least some salmonella, salmonella in your beef, which is kind of gross to think about. Um, as long as it's not above this limit, then it's okay. So a meat inspector comes in and they do a report, and uh, the report they report that the ground beef produced by a company exceeds the USDA limit. Use hypothesis tests to determine whether the meat inspector's claim is true. Okay. So the first thing you're gonna be asked to do is state the null and the alternative and identify the claim. So you've got the null hypothesis and you have the alternative hypothesis. Now, the null and the alternative, okay? We're talking about percentage here. It doesn't say anything about average or mean. It's a percent. Anytime I'm dealing with percent, that's a P, okay? That's that's like a P hat, that's my P, my proportion. The proportion, proportion. We'll talk about proportion, um, I think in 7.4 maybe, maybe 7.3, that's okay. Whatever it is, we'll talk about it when we get there. Now, proportion, that's my percent. What are we claiming here? The meat inspector reports that it exceeds the USDA limit of 7.5.
So they are making the claim that it's greater than the 7.5%. Now I need to write 7.5 as a decimal, 0 0.075, okay? So what am I saying here? I'm saying P is greater than. So is that the null or the alternative? Well, it doesn't have an equal in it, so it's got to be the alternative. So P greater than 0 0.075, that's my claim. So I'll label the claim, identify it. What is the null? The opposite of being greater than, exceeding the limit, is not exceeding the limit, being less than or equal to 0 0.075. Okay? So that's the null and the alternative. Is the hypothesis a left or right-tailed or two-tailed test? How do we tell the type of test? I look at the ha. What does the ha tell me? When I look at this, what type of test? It is pointing which way? It's pointing to the right. So it's a right-tailed test. Right-tailed test, okay? So you're going to get two points for setting it up like this, getting the null and the alternative, okay? And you're going to get two more points for telling me the type of test, okay? Describe the type 1 error and type 2 errors. Which one is worse? Now, we got to think about this for a second. The type 1 error, this is my alpha. This is whenever I reject the hoe when I shouldn't. Okay, reject the hoe when I shouldn't. What is the hoe here? The hoe says that P is less than 0 0.075. So in the context of the problem, in the context of the problem, this would be USDA limit salmonella the percentage of ground beef that has salmonella is less than 7.5%. Okay, that's the hoe. That's what the hoe says. You know what? It's under the limit, so we're good to go. Okay? So, type 1 error, okay, type 1 error would be the scenario. This occurs when you actually, the actual, sorry, the actual proportion of contaminated ground beef is less than or equal to 0 0.075, but you reject the hoe anyway. What's bad about this? Well, you might create a health scare and hurt the cell of ground beef. Okay? And then in turn, what is that going to do? Um, that's going to end up killing the company. They're going to have to close down. They're going to have to re clean out all everything and get rid of their inventory and start over and try to create some process that makes it cleaner when actuality is it did meet the conditions of being less than the 7.5% threshold. So this really hurts the meat company. The error is, you know, they're saying the meat was bad, but really the meat was okay to eat basically is the error going on here. That's the type one error. The, they, the meat um, USD inspector, USDA inspector says the meat was had too much salmonella in it when in reality it didn't have 
uh, above the limit that's okay to have, all right? Now the type two error, let me use a different color. So type two error, type two is my beta. This is fail to reject H naught, fail to reject the hoe when you should, okay? So how does the type two happen? The type two error, this occurs when the actual proportion of contaminated ground beef producers Okay, hold on. So uh, this occurs when the actual proportion of contaminated ground beef is greater than 0 0.075, but does not reject HO. What does that mean? What does that mean for us? That means that you could be allowing ground beef that exceeds the USD li USDA limit um, on salmonella to be sold <laughs> to consumers. Why is that an error? Well, my goodness, you could <clears throat> you're passing off meat that's not good. The the inspector comes in and they say, all right, we've done the test and the statistics say that um, the meat's okay to eat. But in actuality, the proportion is higher of salmonella is higher in that meat content. It's, you know, it's higher than the 7.5%. And therefore, you're selling meat to the public that could make people sick. They could get food poisoning. They could even, you know, that could even result in death for some people. So what's worse? Potentially putting a business out of, uh, putting some company out of business, um, you know, even though they weren't doing anything wrong. Or um, saying, you know, a company's doing everything okay and then they sell food to the public that's actually bad and it kills people. You know, that's a, that's a pretty big ethics question, right? So is it people over profits or profits over people, right? So, you know, that's a, that's a judgment call. You know, what's, what's better to protect against? Is it better to protect your consumer or is it better to protect the company? You know, that's, that's a moral question that you're going to have to answer yourself. And th this is why statisticians make the big bucks because it's not just about calculating and running the test. You have very complicated um, dilemmas that pop up, okay? So, so it's your job not just to run through the test but to interpret what the results actually mean, okay? So as you're seeing, there's a lot going on in the interpretation of the situation, okay? So interpret rejecting H naught. There is enough evidence to support the claim of the meat 
inspector. Now, why did I use the word support here and not reject? Because my claim <clears throat> was the ha. Anytime my claim is the ha, I use the word support. Now, interpret the results if I fail to reject the hoe. Okay? I fail to reject the hoe. There is not enough evidence to support the claim of the meat inspector, okay? So there wasn't enough evidence to support the claim that the ground beef exceeded the FDA or the USDA limits, okay? So um, the difference between these two statements is there is and there is not. If <clears throat> I interpret, if I find that I'm going to reject the hoe, then I say there is enough evidence. If I interpret that I'm going to fail to reject the hoe, then I say there is not enough evidence. Okay? It's just like <clears throat> when you're running through the, the criminal case and you assume they're innocent. Okay? But then, you know, the prosecution, they bring all the evidence forward and the evidence looks pretty... Um, pretty stacked against the uh, defendant, I guess. And then you have to come to the conclusion, my goodness, there is enough evidence here to support the claim that this person's guilty, okay? Whereas, and, and if we support that they're guilty, then we reject the original assumption, the null hypothesis, the hoe, that assumes you're innocent. You assume somebody's innocent until they're proven guilty, okay? If I fail to reject, that means that there was not enough evidence brought forward to the case to say, look, guys, we can't get rid of this innocence assumption. There's not enough, innoc there's not enough evidence here to say we can reject innocence. Now, we fail to reject innocence doesn't mean that the person's innocent. It just means there's not enough evidence to show that they're guilty, okay? And so there's not enough evidence to support the claim, all right, that they're, that they're guilty. All right, that's it.